We will go on to our next witness. Uh, Natasha Kroll is an associate professor at the University of Westminster. She's associated with the Center for the Study of Democracy. Her research and publications covered themes relating to democracy, political economy, identity, and feminist and, coast, uh, and post-colonial uh, critiques. And uh, we will now hear from uh, Ms. Kroll. Uh, yeah, or should Natasha. I say Dr. Kroll? Uh, yeah, Kroll, actually. Uh, thank you so much. I um, Let me just start the timer because I have to fill, uh, fill this house in on... Apologies. Fill this house in on a thousand years in five minutes. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, but let me begin by saying good afternoon to everyone here, Chair Showman and everyone else. Um, I want to begin by saying that I'm mindful of the ironies of speaking here in non-communal terms, being someone who's a Kashmiri Pandit herself by birth, um, but also being someone who's from Kashmir, grew up in India, lives in England, uh, and is speaking in the US today. So there are multiple colonial transitions there that are important. And I think that um, because my written statement is already with you, uh, I will focus on some of those points. But let me just respond to a few things by start, starting to say, by start, uh, starting out by saying that the parallels with, uh, with Nazi Germany and with the Holocaust are actually very apt because the RSS in India, and about whom concerns were raised in the morning as well, is a nationwide paramilitary that is the ideological parent of the current ruling party. And the RSS has avowedly an idea of turning India into a Hindu nation. It also has this idea of an undivided India where everything, everything else in the region will become a part of a Hindu India. Please also remember that the New York Times in 1922 had profiled Hitler saying that Mr. Hitler's anti-Semitism is neither as, neither as violent nor as genuine as it sounds. So things take time to unfold and the proto-fascist trajectory that sadly the, the secular democracy of India is on is very worrying for us all. Let me also say that Shujat Bukhari, I have been to Kashmir every year, you know, uh, 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, including this year during the elections when the whole place was deserted. Uh, and, and Shujaat Bukhari on that visit in at the end of 2016 was the person who had launched my novel. I also write fiction in Kashmir. There is a video of that on YouTube. And he had spoken about the value and worth of what I'm saying. So I do not represent here Indian interests or Pakistani interests. And in fact, that is precisely the problem that the people who speak about Kashmiri self-interest and the rights of Kashmiris themselves are the ones who are most vulnerable uh, from any and every side. The communal politics serves no one. It does not serve the Indians. And Kashmir, if Kashmir were a communal issue, then, then Muslims in India would feel the same as Kashmiri Muslims, and they do not. So it is not a communal issue. It is, al albeit, a, an issue that has been communalized. I also want to say that every other day for Kashmiris is a commemoration of a massacre. And when Indians, and this is really not personally against Indians or Pakistanis, but when Indians expect a uh, an acknowledgement of a massacre like the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, where, you know, where under General Dyer, fire was opened on unarmed protesters. What about all of the Kashmiri protesters? What we are asking here is really very, very simple. We're asking for human rights, for substantive democracy, and for the question of freedom, that people who have been fired upon for just gathering nonviolently over the years in numerous massacres that I have listed in my statement, there should be an acknowledgement from the state to say, we are sorry. Nothing can move on until there is an acknowledgement of all of the human rights violations that have gone on for this people who have been an important site of early Buddhism, who have seen Hindu rulers, who have seen Mughal rulers, Afghan rulers, and, and then who have been sold for the equivalent of something like 150,000 US dollars uh, in 1846 by the treaty of, uh, by clauses of the treaty of Lahore and Amritsar without their consent and who have then had an unrepresentative ruler who's, uh, you know, throughout the 19th century, it's a story of absolute tragedy. And when we come into the 20th century, I mean, Kashmir is one of the first interstate disputes that the UN was prominently involved in. And there are several resolutions in those early years that the UN was actually trying under various people to demilitarize under Norton, under Dixon, under Menzies. This is a long and complex history, but that complexity should not blind us to the very, should not 
uh, obviate from us, obfuscate from us the very simple fact that there is a political problem here which is compounded by human rights violations and the international community has a role because this has not just uh, implications for Kashmiris who are currently under siege and under collective punishment being deprived of their very basic rights, but it also has regional and potentially global implications because people travel across borders and ideas when they are suffocated have an, and dissent when it is suffocated becomes the, uh, you know, the hardest to handle. So I want to say, um, I also want to look at the time because can, can someone just tell me how many minutes, seconds do I have? I do have time. Okay. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I do want to. Uh, yeah, I want to take my five minutes for sure. The the question here is really not so much about Article 370. The fundamental question here is about the consent of the people. If something is being carried out, if my time, my time, my time. If something is being carried out for people's welfare for their development, then why does it need tens of thousands of troops being brought in? Why does it have to happen overnight without absolute any absolutely any consultation of the people with placing even the pro-India politicians in prison and then depriving the population of the right to say anything? If it is for their good, then why won't anyone of them be allowed to say something about it? This is an egregious human rights violation. It goes against consent, goes against fundamental principles of dissent as they relate to democracy. And as people who are being claimed in the name of a democracy, as rights-bearing individuals, this is something that they fundamentally should be uh, you know, allowed to, um, to do. This is Thank arbitrary you. use Thank of you. power with no accountability. Thank you. No, I appreciate it, and I, I believe you have something to contribute. Yes, to yes, I'm actually dying to say something. So, uh, so we recently, me and uh, Atharzia, another Kashmiri, we compiled the first ever volume on women in Kashmir, entirely written by Kashmiri women scholars themselves. And the 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 realities of it are astoundingly uh, worrying. You know, there's there's the Kunan Poshpura mass rapes. There's various instances of sexual violence, the competing patriarchies of militarization and militancy that women have to face but Kashmir is not backward when it comes to women's rights in fact compared to India it is it has always been more progressive in 1944 the new Kashmir manifesto this this is important this is important for the world to know in 1944 the new Kashmir manifesto actually specifically had a whole section on gender rights which if you read today sounds progressive and is so Kashmiri women have always had their rights in fact much of what has been going on this is a very colonial move on the part of the nation states around it of claiming as, lib as, the, as if they are liberating Kashmiri women, as if they are mere territory. And in the aftermath, in the aftermath Thanks. of the revocation of Article 370, BJP I, I leaders have, said, apologize, we are going to now marry my, fair Kashmiri women. Uh, the first thing somebody wants, before they want human rights, they want to live. I've, Once I've you heard live. that rationale, but it still doesn't explain the lack of transparency to me. Ms. Call, could you, could you address that? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. There's no justification whatsoever for what they're doing, and they know that, which is why it is important not to, for them not to let people speak. In fact, elderly women in Srinagar who were protesting in, in Kashmir Valley were, were released on, were detained, arrested, released on the condition that they sign bonds saying that they won't speak to the media. This is just two days ago. So it is, it is fundamentally not about violent actors. It is about knowing that what is being carried out is politically and constitutionally not right, and it doesn't have the support of people. Let Secondly, me just, uh, I'm sorry, let me stop you before my time runs out, because I just want to say as an observation here, and I wish we had more time to, for all of you to weigh in, that to me, when there isn't transparency, something is being hidden. And this is what really concerns Absolutely. me terribly.